Uh, Jeff Fraser. I live up in Scotts Valley. I'm a retired neurologist. I've been retired for a few years now. Uh, our daughter went to Scotts Valley High School. And so when I retired, I thought about anything that I might want to talk to the high school students about. And I've done a couple of talks at the local high school up there. One of them is a version of this talk that I'm going to give you, which is one of my favorite talks. Mm -hmm. I'm not a, a physicist. I'm not an astronomer. But I do have, I've always really enjoyed physics and the history of science, and that's kind of how this came about. Um, so uh, the subtitle of this talk is Early Astronomers and the Birth of Science. Uh, I could add in one other little tidbit and, and say, the, and the birth of calculus, but I didn't want to scare people. <laughs> <laughs> You, at the very end, when we talk about Isaac Newton, we'll just see just a little whiff of calculus and how he might have come to see the need for calculus. <laughs> but that'll come later. Uh, up until that point, we're going we're gonna, to at times introduce some good old-fashioned geometry, maybe a little bit of trigonometry, just some sort of basic mathematical reasoning. So if anybody feels like uh, they need a refresher on anything like that. When we get to it, just raise your hand and we can talk about it. Okay. So a few words of introduction. Uh, there's going to be at least three themes that are going to come up time and again during the course of these four classes. One of the themes is the influence of society and culture on scientific progress, something that's very interesting to, to consider. Uh, you know, why, why did things evolve when they did, how they did, and so forth. Another important theme is <clears throat> the synergy between advances in mathematics and advances in the physical sciences. I think you have a, probably have a little bit of idea about that, but we're going to look at some very concrete examples of how that worked. And then finally, I want to make the case that the history of astronomy, at least up until the scientific revolution, let's say, up until that time, the history of astronomy is the quintessence of the history of science. I want to make that case. <clears throat> now, again, uh, sort of sidebar, um, as you might tell, as you might um, uh, have guessed, Perhaps I, I spent a fair amount of time looking for just the right words like synergy and quintessence. So let me show you why I settled on quintessence. It's kind of an interesting word. Uh, the history goes back uh, to the early days. For the ancients, the quintessence was was the fifth and highest element in ancient and medieval philosophy that permeates all nature and is the substance composing the celestial bodies. So that was an important part of their cosmology, at least in some circles. But the but the so that's kind of an interesting uh, little sidebar. But the two definitions here that are relevant is the essence of a thing in its purest and most concentrated form, and the most typical example or representative. And I think that's what the history of astronomy gives us vis-a-vis -vis the history of science. Okay, <clears throat> so as I say, uh, sometimes when I give a talk like this, I get very careful about wanting to choose the right words. Maybe you might even say a little obsessive with words. Um, and when I give a talk like this, sometimes, uh, as you might guess, I'll write out a script and play with it and, and get it just where how I want it. And then I start to worry I'm going to forget some of that or leave something out. And so I get a little anxious about giving a talk in front of people. So uh, and and in, in the past, sometimes I have memorized certain passages. But what I've done more recently, uh, you might find interesting, I found another solution. And what I do, and I hope this is okay with you, uh, I uh, sometimes will pre-record certain segments of the talk <clears throat> as audio files, and then I'll sprinkle them into the slideshow. Uh, one advantage of that is that... Uh, for the next hour and a half, you don't have to listen to just my voice droning on and on because I have hired the services of a virtual assistant narrator <laughs> through the magic of AI. And I hope I don't get, um, I hope I'm, you're, I'm not offending anybody as, 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 as pulling a deep fake over you, but I have used some online software to transform my voice into a clone of the voice of David Attenborough. 
So I hope everybody's okay with that. Again, his voice, I think, is much more pleasing. All right, so we begin with a few definitions. Again, we're still sort of in the introductory phase here, but what is science? I think that's a question we have to ask, and you probably all have a feeling for that. Now, as we go forward, let's remember the words of Einstein, who said, one thing I have learned in a long life, that all of our science measured against reality is primitive and childlike, and yet it is the most precious, precious thing we have. Oops. Okay, so I would say that uh, science is knowledge gained through the rigorous and ongoing application of the scientific method. Well, that's easy, but what is the scientific method? How do we define that? And if, if you read, read about it, maybe I'm speaking too loud. No, yeah. no, uh, no, no, it's me. It's it, came, it came on. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> So what is the scientific method? Again, you can find different ways of describing it, but let's just be simple. Whoops. Um, number one, make careful observations of, of events in the physical world. Okay, that's a good start. Now, does anybody know who this is? Richard Feynman. Very good. Very good. Now, Richard Feynman said this. I learned then what science was about. It was patience. If you looked and you watched and you paid attention, you got a great reward from it. Although possibly not every time. <laughs> so uh, Richard Feynman, uh, some of you might know, he won a Nobel Prize in physics at the same time while earning a reputation at Caltech as not only a genius, but a mischief maker. Somebody who, who liked to pull pranks and, and all of that. He had a minor role in the um, Manhattan Project movie. You might, might remember that. That was when he was still quite young. Uh, let's see, document regularities or recurring patterns, very important. And at that point, uh, <laughs> formulate a testable hypothesis that postulates a fundamental principle governing those regularities, okay. Uh, explanations based on supernatural causes are not allowed. That's kind of a distinguishing feature that comes up here in a moment. And then finally, my uh, trigger here is a little, a little sensitive, but test the hypothesis, make a prediction. Okay, so what we'll see with the ancient Greeks is they were very comfortable with steps one and two. They were starting to play around a little bit with cosmology, trying to figure out first principles. They got it wrong, as you might expect, uh, most of the time, but they were at least playing around with it. But it won't be until we get to the scientific revolution where we start to see a sophisticated approach to testing a hypothesis. And that's part of what made the scientific revolution revolutionary. <laughs> now, why does science uh, begin with astronomy? Uh, well, events in the heavens, at least as we observe them, tend to recur with striking regularity. And accurate predictions are possible if you make those careful observations and record them over long periods of time. You have to be patient. <laughs> By comparison, events on Earth often appear random and chaotic. Change is a constant. Certainly, regular regularities do occur, but they seem there seem to be frequent exceptions. So, I but I will remind you. Uh, or make a point here that there is one regularity that we see here on Earth that suggests a highly predictable natural phenomenon. And you might have some things that come to mind, but I have one thing in mind. So this is kind of guess what I'm thinking. <laughs> you want to play guess what I'm thinking? Gravity. Sure. <laughs> you have an idea? People live and then they die. <laughs> <laughs> Death and taxes, right? <laughs> now what I'm- comes up every day. <laughs> that's good. Uh, that's good. Uh, what I'm thinking, I just want to make the point that uh, here on Earth, without looking at the sun or the moon or the star or anything, what goes up must come down. Oh, what goes up must come down. down. Gravity. Yeah. We, they didn't call it gravity. They just they they knew what goes up must come down. Okay. And so why begin with the Greeks? This has always been a very interesting question for me. What were the Greeks especially smart? 
uh, probably not any smarter than anybody else. So why, why do we start with the Greeks? History teaches us the, that the Greeks had a preeminent role here in establishing astronomy as a science. But we have to uh, grapple with one very important fact. They were not the first astronomers. So let's talk about that. Here comes David Attenborough. Their predecessors in Babylonia and Egypt recorded large volumes of careful observations that enabled them to make predictions of celestial events with ever increasing accuracy. The ancient Greeks themselves understood that there was much to learn from the Babylonians and the Egyptians, and the fragmentary biographical material available to us from that era suggests that many of the early Greek astronomers, mathematicians, and philosophers, including the legendary Pythagoras, traveled and studied in Babylonia, Egypt, or both. Nevertheless, Carl Sagan, in his book Cosmos, along with other authorities on the history of science, credit the ancient Greeks for giving birth to science because they aimed to explain the world around them without reference to mythology or supernatural forces. To understand how this trend might have come about, let's back up a bit. Okay, so a little history, a little history in historical sociology. Um, ancient Egypt and Babylonia, as we think of them primarily, uh, were highly structured hier hierarchical societies with a strong central authority and very limited social mobility. In fact, uh, it, it was generally believed that um, uh, this hierarchy was ordained by the gods. Okay, so important point there. So you had the kings and the pharaohs, the top of the ladder. The Babylonian kings derived their right to rule based on divine appointment by Babylon's patron deity, Marduk, and through consecration by the city's priests. Pharaohs were actually considered divine beings themselves and served as intermediaries between the gods and humans. Religion may have served many purposes, but for these rulers, its most important role was to validate and maintain their authority. Okay. Keep in mind that both in Egypt and Babylonia, there were frequent periods of major wars going on, a lot of violence and fighting back and forth. But we're talking about the times when there was relative peace. And the reason there was relative peace was because they somehow by serendipity, there were periods of time when they had a strong central authority. And for those periods of time, I think people recognized that that was a good thing. And so for the Pharaoh, especially one of his big jobs was maintaining order. Order was a big concept during these uh, king, the three uh, kingdoms or uh, the, all the dynasties. Then you had the priests, and their primary role was to serve and support the pharaoh or the, or the king. And in this case, it meant that they were in charge of the religion and religious dogma and ensuring that the religion was followed everywhere with all the necessary rituals and rites. So they were a very privileged class. They had this symbiotic relationship with the pharaoh or the king. And in order to maintain the status quo, they had to work together to create this um, culture. Astronomy was closely linked to religion, and because religion was so important in maintaining the status quo, there was every incentive to interpret celestial phenomena in religious terms, and no incentive to interpret them in terms of natural causes. And then we have the scribes. This was another fairly privileged class, a little bit larger than the priests, but still a select group. They'd been picked, they'd been educated, and now they served at the pleasure of the priests and the king and the pharaoh. So again, they were invested in maintaining this status quo, this order. And none of these people had any real incentive to share their knowledge uh, with the wider audience, with the common people. 
who of course were at the bottom of the ladder. So there was probably a, a society, a good example of a lot of economic disparity. Um, you've had the common people being the farmers and the laborers, some, some craftsmen, but not a, not a big middle class. Were they slaves also? Well, slaves. You know, that's an interesting question that when they built the pyramids, you know, you, you've got this image uh, when you look at it or read about it of hundreds, thousands of laborers building the, the, the uh, pyramids. Were they slaves? Maybe it depends on what you want to call them. I, I, I understand they were well fed because they had to be well fed. Uh, so they were a valuable source of labor. But I'm not sure they had much choice. <laughs> I don't know how many of them volunteered to build the pyramids. So uh, I think again, it's just a, it's it's just an example of how there was a small class of people at the top who had a lot of power and could basically tell people uh, what they were going to do. It also suggests to me that they, that the pyramids were probably being built at a time of either they had conquered some, some neighboring regions and had excess manpower from their conquests, or th their agriculture was thriving so much, they had so much food, they could spare some labor. And maybe this was like a public works project to keep people busy. <laughs> I don't know, it's a good question. It's an interesting question. In this setting, knowledge and learning were proprietary. The situation tended strongly towards stifling a spirit of free inquiry and critical thinking. For these reasons, it seems fair to say that science did not begin with the Babylonians or the Egyptians. Nevertheless, early historians might have given the Babylonians or the Egyptians more credit for their accomplishments in astronomy, except that for a long time, the historical record of their achievements was virtually non-existent. As it stands now, that record remains highly fragmentary and does not lend itself easily to constructing a coherent narrative. Why is that record so fragmentary? And why is the record of the Greeks' accomplishments sufficiently rich to allow for a coherent narrative? With all these questions in mind, let's turn our attention to the Greeks. So the birth of science narrative uh, traditionally begins with Thales of Miletus. Um, he came on the scene around 600 BC. So this was after the, the height of the Egyptian uh, kingdoms, but, and the Babylonians might have still been around, but they're soon going to be conquered by the Persians. In any case, it's a transitional time in any case, and here comes Thales. And as I say, he is um, born, apparently born, or at least living in a town called Miletus, a city called Miletus. Miletus was a Greek city, a very prosperous Greek city on the west coast of Turkey. And Miletus had become a seafaring power, a maritime power, in fact, uh, uh, a couple of centuries at least before Athens rose to its uh, height of power. So there's Miletus, <laughs> in case you hadn't found it. <laughs> Aristotle viewed Thales as the first philosopher in the Greek tradition, and by that he meant the first natural philosopher, that is, a thinker who does not rely on myths or religion to explain natural phenomena. Thales came up with a cosmology based on the foundational principle that ultimately everything is made of or originates from water. As there was no way to test this hypothesis at the time, we should say that Thales was engaging here in speculation, not science. Nevertheless, his speculation represents an attempt to avoid any reference to Greek mythology in explaining the origin of the physical world. Uh, Thales has greatly bolstered his reputation by predicting the eclipse of 585 BCE uh, in the spring of that year. 
I, I almost want to say he correctly predicted it, but uh, nobody seems to know if he predicted the exact date. Mm -hmm. So it was maybe an approximate prediction, but he people were impressed. His, his admirers were impressed with the relative accuracy of his prediction. And I have to say that this photograph was taken of a more recent eclipse. <laughs> I'm not trying to pull another deep, deep break. <laughs> so is anybody a bit surprised to hear about Greeks at this early stage living on the west coast of Turkey? No? Good. Because remember, uh, long before Athens came along, uh, the, Greek, the Greeks had a flourishing seafaring culture. That's what they did. And so they had established colonies and trading networks all around the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And in fact, Miletus was not alone there. There were other important cities on the west coast of Turkey, Ephesus and others. And they all belonged to the Ionian League. Uh, Ionia was the name of that coast at that time. So here's Miletus. It's part of the powerful Ionian League a league of, 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 of commercial trading and so forth. And so the point is that Thales is not uh, exploring natural philosophy in the backwoods somewhere. He's living in the midst of a, of a vibrant uh, uh, center of commerce. Do you read the key for the bridge spaces that's on your chart? What's I that? I can't quite make it out. It says area of Greek something. So, oh, areas of settlement. settlement. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what the red is. Uh, I think uh, some historian said that the Greeks were were spread around the Mediterranean like frogs around the pond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I forget who said that. Somebody said that. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, here's another uh, case in point. There's Miletus and there's Samos. The island, island of Samos. As another case in point, consider the legendary Pythagoras, who was about 50 years younger than Thales. He was born on the island of Samos, just off the Ionian coast and across a narrow channel from Miletus. During Pythagoras' formative years, Samos was a thriving cultural hub and trading center. The Pythagorean theorem was known and used by the Babylonians and Indians centuries before Pythagoras, but he may have been the first to introduce it widely to the Greeks. Then, around the age of 40, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, Pythagoras pulled up stakes and moved to the Greek colony of Croton in what is now southern Italy where he established a scholastic community of followers. So we can imagine the Greeks traveling around the Mediterranean, sharing ideas, spreading ideas, and even establishing schools. Okay, so let's just, in summary, list some conditions that promoted a flourishing intellectual culture among the Ionians and uh, the Greeks. <laughs> I see I've used the word the twice. All right. uh, first, they had a true, the true alphabet. They adapted this from the Phoenicians, but they added something very useful, a new innovation, and that was vowels. First alphabet that had vowels. And so you can imagine now that they have a fairly, relatively speaking, fairly easy way uh, to write. It's easier to learn, to read and write. And so we can imagine literacy uh, increasing uh, as, they, as they develop this alphabet. Uh, lack of any central authority uh, along that Ionian coast and elsewhere in Greece, the coastline is very rugged. So these city-states on the coastline were relatively isolated and independent, and it would have been very hard for any single political entity to sort of dominate that entire region and enforce any conformity to a particular ideology or uh, societal hierarchy. Um, 
Their prosperity was based on a free market economy and extensive trade networks. And these trade, trade networks included Mesopotamia and Egypt. And so these networks facilitated not only the exchange of goods, but the exchange of ideas. Economic competition. As I say, the, the, the city-states on the, on, in Ionia were part of a league, but that was just a loose confederation. They cherished their independence and they were in competition with each other. Uh, uh, Jared Diamond makes that, a point here that's relevant in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, that you may be familiar with. He makes this point. He says, economic competition in this context, just like this, promotes innovation and education. And a, and a developing middle, middle class, I think, or, or commercial class. And then finally, astronomy was of, of immense practical importance with regard to navigation, which meant Im immense practical importance to their the very basis of their economic prosperity. So every incentive to learn as much astronomy as they could. So I think that gives you a good idea these are all conditions that would promote free inquiry and critical thinking in general, I would like to think. And therefore, perhaps we could say that knowledge now is a little bit more open source and not so much proprietary, not so much the, uh, the, the uh, bailiwick of just the privileged class. Does anybody know who this is? Yeah. I bet you do. Alexander. There's Alexander the Great. This is from a mosaic. Uh, of him at the Battle, Battle of Issus, where he was confronting the Persians. Uh, so, oh, yeah, so uh, 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 Alexander was the son of King Philip of Macedonia. And King Philip wanted his son to be well-educated, and so he hired a tutor. So next question, I, you're nodding your head, who was his tutor? Aristotle. Aristotle. Aristotle, very good. So there's Aristotle. Uh, he, I, he must have gotten a pretty good offer because he moves from Athens up to Macedonia <laughs> to tutor uh, young Alexander. And I think from, from what we know, Alexander did in fact develop a true respect and love for Greek intellectual culture. And of course, he also developed another passion. <laughs> <laughs> he also developed a passion for war and conquest, and in a relatively short amount of time, he established the largest empire that the world had ever seen. Part of his goal was to spread Greek culture throughout the known world. So Artigos, leading his army through Asia Minor down into Egypt, which he conquers rather quickly, he establishes a new city there, which he names after himself. Alexandria will quickly become the most important center of learning in the ancient world. The Greek conquerors will build the famous Library of Alexandria, and scholars from all over will come to study its collection of ancient texts. Alexander then takes his army east and conquers the Persian Empire. Now, the Persians had conquered the Babylonian, but they allowed the Babylonian priests to preserve their scientific and mathematical texts. And when Alexander marches into Babylon, he wants to make all those texts available to the Greek scholars. There's just one problem, as you can imagine. They are written in cuneiform on clay tablets. So he commands the Babylonian priests and the Greek scholars to work together to translate all that accumulated knowledge into Greek. So that's, this goes back now to the question, why begin with the Greeks? I think you can see why. Uh, again, to paraphrase Carl Sagan, uh, and others uh, on the history of science, they would they would argue that Greek natural philosophy was a true paradigm shift. And that's why they perhaps uh, deserve some recognition for that. On the other hand, we might be uh, uh, we might be wise to remember the words of Winston Churchill here. History is written by the victors. <laughs> I think you know where I'm going with that. Under Alexander, the Greeks were victorious in conquering Persia and Egypt, 
And for several centuries thereafter, Greek was the lingua franca of the Eastern Mediterranean among scholars and the general public alike. And I'd like to make one other point here. Uh, <clears throat> he, 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 he establishes a new city in Northern Egypt. He names it after himself, Alexandria. That was not the only Alexandria that he founded. He established several Alexandrias throughout the old Persian Empire. So one thing that was not a burden to uh, Alexander was low self-esteem. <laughs> you know, he had no problem with that. All right, a little bit more from David Attenborough here. Uh, this is cuneiform on a clay tablet, and that is not hieroglyphics, but a simplified version of hieroglyphics called hieratic script from an Egyptian medical text, 1550 BCE. So again, if, I don't know if we could call their version of medicine scientific or not, but there's other examples where they had learned a lot about <laughs> healthcare. Um, including perhaps some surgery. <clears throat> anyway, let's uh, let's listen to uh, Sir David. Meanwhile, the use of cuneiform soon died out, and the vast majority of those original Babylonian clay tablets were lost to history. The ancient language of the Egyptians and their scholarly texts suffered a similar fate. Clay tablets and papyrus are subject to destruction and decay and the texts they contain are typically lost unless copies are periodically made. You might wonder about Egyptian hieroglyphics carved in stone. Writing in hieroglyphics was highly labor-intensive and was used mainly in public buildings, such as in temples, tombs, and monuments. Here, it primarily subserved religious narratives, propaganda, and panegyrics. These hieroglyphics, of course, have been preserved at many sites, but they don't tell us much about the Egyptian understanding of astronomy. More scholarly works would have typically been written on papyrus in more simplified and time-saving cursive scripts, the Hieratic script and later the demonic spirit. This. In contrast, thanks to the conquests of Alexander and later, Rome's often reverent approach to preserving Greek culture, Greek manuscripts were copied over the decades and centuries. Much has been lost, but much has survived. <clears throat> All right, uh, now we get to dive into some of the actual astronomers who we mentioned Thales, he, he counts, but uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna really focus now on, on the development of Greek astronomy. And we begin with a, a fellow named Anaximander, again from the sixth century BCE. He was a student of Thales. So there was a tradition, a, a, a school, so to speak. And he came up with the notion of the celestial spheres. So uh, let's think about that for a minute. I think any casual observer of the night sky recognizes that the celestial bodies, uh, not just the sun, but the moon and the stars and the planets rise in the east and set in the west. But what Anam Anaximander did in particular was he looked north at night and he looked north for several hours at a time. And this is what he would have seen. If I can play this. North Star, right in the middle. It's not moving. That's why the North Star is such a reliable guide. Anyway, I just thought that was a sort of a dramatic video that somebody made. And now the question will be, can I get back to, yeah, there we go. So Anaximander sees the North Star as kind of a very intriguing focal point. And he develops this notion of the 
of the celestial sphere and all of the stars are fixed in place on this sphere. So they're fixed, they don't move relative to each other, but the whole sphere rotates. But it rotates around an axis with the North Star at one end of that axis. So he's, he's explained why we see what we see. Um, he also had the idea that the Earth is a cylinder, flat cylinder that floats in the infinite, in infinite space. That also was a relatively new idea, apparently, as we'll see. Um, now, the people who came after Anaximander, of course, recognized that the, um, the planets and the moon, and the sun, don't rotate in synchrony with the fixed stars, so they had to come up with a separate sphere for each of them, and that's how we eventually get to multiple spheres. I mean, we'll, we'll come back to that later. But for now, let's compare. Uh, oh, Karl Popper calls uh, Anaximander's idea of Earth floating in the infinite, one of the boldest, most revolutionary, and most portentous ideas in the whole history of human thinking. Karl Popper was a, a historian of science. But, uh, but here's the comparison between Thales, the mentor, and Anaximander, uh, the student. We can appreciate Anaximander's originality by comparing his theory with that of his teacher, Thales. Thales thought the Earth floated in a giant ocean and that there was only one up and one down. For Thales, things fell in one direction only, from high to low. Anaximander thought that whenever you go in any direction away from Earth, you are going up or higher, and that the Earth was therefore the center of the universe. No, original thinker. Okay, time for a little pop quiz. This is just, again, maybe a guessing game unless you know the answer. But <laughs> in what century did someone first have the idea that the Earth revolved around the sun and not the other way around? This is as far as we know. Guess. It's a trick question. <laughs> it's a trick question. <laughs> well, you might be thinking of Copernicus, who we'll get to earlier. But uh, interestingly, the first person lived in the... Third century BCE. He had a revolutionary idea. And his name was Aristarchus of Samos, another person from Samos. Again, very small area uh, of, of the Greek uh, empire or Greek uh, uh, region of, 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 of a habitation. So Aristarchus of Samos comes up with this idea. <clears throat> And the point is that the Greeks are starting to ask some very interesting questions, very basic questions, but questions that did not yet have an answer. Is the Earth round or flat? How far away is the sun? And how big is the Earth? And Aristarchus starts to look at some of these questions, and he begins with this one. Which is closer to us, the sun or the moon? Good question. Think about the phases of the moon. Aristarchus would agree with us that the moon revolves around the earth. If we assume, as Aristarchus did, that what we see of the moon depends on the sunlight that it reflects, we can quickly understand that we see a full moon when the earth is almost directly between the moon and the sun. Similarly, we can deduce that a new moon, that is, the time when the moon is not visible to us, occurs when the moon is more or less directly between the Earth and the sun, and none of the light it reflects can reach us. In fact, when the moon is precisely between us and the sun, we get a solar eclipse. So the moon must be closer to us than the sun. The more interesting question is, how much closer is the moon? So he wants to figure that out. And here's what he does. He starts with a premise, just using sort of simple reason. Based on that, those phases of the moon, when we see a half moon, well, that must mean that uh, it's halfway between a full moon, which would be over here, and a new moon. 
And so if you draw this line here from the sun to the moon, and then a, a line from the moon to the earth, that's a 90 degree angle. And now we're getting into triangles because he's going to draw another line. Oops. And now we've got a right triangle. Well, the Greeks love right triangles, Pythagoras, of course. And so he can make a measurement now. It's only one measurement he needs to make. He can measure this angle theta. Don't want to look directly at the sun, but okay. Maybe just for a brief second, he looks at the sun, he measures this angle. It's 87 degrees by his measurement. And now uh, you may remember that the, the internal angles of a triangle always add up to 180. So what's left? There's just three degrees over here. And what that means is <clears throat> they can use, uh, they are also very big on ratios of, of triangle sides. And so if you have a right triangle and it's got these angles, you can calculate or determine the ratio of S, which is the distance to the sun, with the, with the M, which is the distance to the moon. And given uh, these measurements in terms of angles, S to M, that ratio is 19. So the sun is 19 times farther away from us than the moon is. Well, that, that's kind of interesting because he also knew about angular diameters. That's just a simple concept. Here he is looking at the moon. He doesn't know the linear diameter, the absolute diameter of the moon, but he can measure the angle that is subtended by the moon. And it turns out to be a half a degree. But he can also uh, measure the angular diameter of the sun. And it also is a half a degree. Kind of a coincidence. And you may have come across somebody remarking on this coincidence. That's why we get such a nice tight solar eclipse because they line up so, so perfectly. But that's just, that's just a coincidence. But anyway, so knowing this, if the distance to the sun is 19 times greater than the distance to the moon, the sun also has to uh, be 19 times bigger. So it's big. The sun is big, so they're starting to figure some things out. Uh, and again, this is just to show how you, you know, if you want to get into the nitty gritty, it's just a simple matter of drawing these triangles, and they're similar triangles because this angle is the same as that angle, and the other two angles are equal because it's an isosceles triangle. Anyway, similar triangles allow you to uh, compare the ratio of the sides. So the fact that the sun is so far away uh, has an important uh, consequence going forward. And that is that the sun's rays as they fall on earth are roughly parallel to each other. Now, looking at this diagram, you might argue that, no, that's not what you're showing here. Because in fact, it looks like the sun ray from this side of the sun and, and this side of the sun are not parallel at all. But that's because the drawing's not to scale. The sun is very, very far away. So it's only a half a degree away from being perfectly parallel. And that's a small enough amount that it's not going to affect some conclusions that are coming up. So uh, we're leaving Aristarchus here. He's made his contributions. And I'm just going to sort of set up a thought experiment that will become, become relevant in just, just a little bit. So this thought experiment goes as follows. Let's say the Earth is flat and the sun's rays are parallel. So if you have these cypress trees located at, at three different points, Macedonia, Athens, and Alexandria, and you have a couple of assistants, then you're going to measure the angle of the shadow. And you want to measure it at the same moment. So let's say at noon on a particular date. So if the Earth is flat and the sun's rays are parallel, the shadows should all be the same in terms of the, uh, the length measured along the ground. So again, we're dealing with similar triangles and so forth. But if the Earth is round, the shadows will not be the same for this very reason. I think you can see it there. So very simple thought experiment, but still the cleverness here. When they do time. Ah, thank you. We're going to get to that in a minute. You anticipated something I'm going to show you in just a moment. 
Uh, so along comes a fellow named Eratosthenes. This is the third century BCE. He's a mathematician, a geographer, and astronomer. And guess where he's doing his work? <laughs> he's also the chief librarian at the Library of Alexandria, this marvelous center of learning uh, throughout the ancient world. So he, he, he probably already earned a, a reputation to get to that position. And yeah, we're going to come to your question a little bit, but I'm going to set the stage for his experiments. We need to look at the, a map of Egypt. So here's Alexandria up here, and there's a city way down here named Syene. And Eratosthenes has heard rumors uh, that kind of raise his level of curiosity. He's heard a rumor that, oh, by the way, this is the Tropic of Cancer. We'll get back to that in a minute. But, but what, what, what um, Eratosthenes has heard is that there's a well at Syene, and the sun is generally to the south, as it is in the Northern Hemisphere. And so when the sun strikes the top of the well, uh, those light, sun rays don't permeate the well very, very much for most of the year. Most of the well remains in, in, in shadow. But when we get to the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, the sun is higher in the sky if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. And bingo, it's right above the well at noon. And so now this well lights up magically from almost top to bottom. So that's very interesting to Eratosthenes. So again, stepping back for a minute, we'll talk about the Tropic of Cancer. <laughs> That was not something Eratosthenes knows about, but we want to look at it from the modern viewpoint here a little bit. And remember that as the Earth goes around the sun and it's tilted on its axis, in the summer, in the northern hemisphere, we're, we're tilted towards the sun, and, and maximally so at the, at the, on the day of the summer mm -hmm. solstice, which means if you're an observer here standing on the Tropic of Capricorn, at noon, the sun is going to be directly overhead. But if you're a little We're standing up somewhere on the trunk oh, of cancer, the sun, we already covered that. Um, but if you're standing to the north, you are going to cast a shadow. But if you were standing. So here's Eratosthenes. He plants a pole in, in the ground in Alexandria, and he makes sure that it's plumb, so it's standing vertically. And lo and behold, at noon on this day of the summer solstice, the pole casts a shadow. He has just proven that the earth is round. It was that simple, but he wants to go farther than that. But this gets to our question first, how did he know it was noon? Well, yeah, so this is this principle of the sundial. In the morning when the sun first comes up, the shadow is gonna be to the west and it's gonna be relatively long, but as, it's, as the morning progresses, the shadow gets shorter and shorter. It's still there, it doesn't go away in Alexandria, but he can mark the position at, at, at different increments of time, and he can go back and say, aha, this was noon, and this is the length at noon. So there's the answer to your question. Um, <clears throat> so what he does is, he, he knows the length of the pole, and then he can measure the length of the shadow. So we've got two sides of a right triangle again. So here we are, right triangles. Good old Pythagoras. And based on that, I mean, he could just measure the angle maybe, but he doesn't even need to. He knows the ratio of L to S, so he knows the angle theta, and it's seven degrees. Now, at this point, he hires a team of people uh, to measure the distance from Syene to Alexandria. I've been told that what he, what lady might do this is to hire soldiers to march in unison because they've been trained to regulate their steps to a very uniform distance. And that's how you can, you have them march together so they keep it, they keep each other in sync. But anyway, 5,000 stadia. Uh, not sure how, we'll, we'll come to that to just, that's a, that's a unit of distance for the ancients, 5,000 stadia. Now, a little bit of geometry that might ring a bell. This is from good old Euclid. 
Remember the sun's rays are parallel. So if you have two parallel rays, and then you have a third line that intersects them, that dotted line, this green angle here is always going to be equal to that green angle. Those are the interior angles of, uh, of intersection. And that's, uh, that is a, uh, a known fact, thanks to Euclid. So here we go. Here's that little diagram here for reference. We've got the two parallel rays. Uh, here's the well at Syene. Here's the pole at Alexandria. Remember, this is perpendicular to the Earth. So if you continue a line straight down, it's going to go to the center of the Earth, as is a line drawn down that well and continued on. And they're going to intersect at the center of the Earth. So I think you can see what I'm getting now. We've got two parallel lines and this line that intersects. This angle and this green angle are the same. So this angle is seven degrees. And we can measure angles in degrees. We can also measure arcs in degrees. It's really almost the same thing. But if you have a perfect circle out here, which we assume, this arc, we can say that its length is seven degrees. And we know that the absolute distance is 5,000 stadia. So if, if the Earth is round, as he's already proven, and this is seven degrees, well, that's 1 50th of a circle. So you would say, well, if we multiply this distance by 50, we should get the entire circumference. And that's exactly what he did. So he estimates that the circumference of the Earth is 250,000 stadia. And in modern terms, that apparently would be about 40,000 kilometers, which turns out to be an extremely accurate estimate of the Earth mm -hmm. circumference. So he did a good job. And it's interesting if they did it like from Athens to Sicily, it wouldn't have worked. Thank you. Ex excellent point. The whole the whole uh, basis of this uh, thought experiment or this yeah experiment is that you, that you want them to be on the same longitude, right? As you say, if you do Athens and Sicily, it's not going to work. Well, you may have noticed, Syene is not exactly on the same longitude, but it's close enough for his estimate. Lucky. Again, lucky. No. And then some people have also pointed out, well, Syene is not exactly on the Tropic of Cancer, and those two sources of error kind of cancel out. <laughs> Again, a little bit of serendipity. But I think, again, I think you can see the cleverness here. Um, yeah. Um, the, the estimate of the ratio of the distance to the moon and the sun, um, I think it's very wrong. Um, yes. I, I, yes, I, it I, is. I, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't like to want to leave that uncommented because Thank it's you. about coming out to 90 instead of <laughs> uh, thank you for pointing that out. It's good, it's good to make a comment. So, right. So I've just showed you an example of an estimate that was actually pretty accurate. That estimate, you're, you're right, is wrong. And the reason was 87 degrees was the angle he measured. It's actually very close to 90 degrees, which puts the sun even farther away. So again, again, I won't fault him because I'm not sure you want to look at the sun. Uh, and the half moon, uh, probably hard to measure that angle. But thank you. So yeah, <laughs> let's not give the Greeks too much credit. <laughs> but they were trying, and they were using reasoning. And sometimes they they got it right, and sometimes not so much. Uh, Hipparchus. This is still uh, uh, back uh, before the Common Era. Uh, at one point, he, or by some historians, he's been considered uh, to be the greatest astronomer of the ancient world uh, by those in the know, and that's because he he came up with very accurate models of the relative motions of the moon and the sun. So he got a lot of credit for that. Also known as the father of trigonometry. So you can like him or dislike him accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then maybe almost 300 years later, along comes Ptolemy. So Hipparchus might have been uh, the greatest astronomer of the ancient world, but he wasn't the most famous. That title goes to Ptolemy. Why does it go to Ptolemy? Because he wrote a book 
called the Alma Chest, which was preserved. So we have more or less a complete record of his encyclopedic knowledge of, of astronomy, all of his work, but also a compendium of all the work that had been done prior to Ptolemy. Compared to all the other ancient Greek writings on astronomy, the Almagest was by far the most widely read and most frequently copied throughout the ancient world and well into the Middle Ages. But there is a minor problem here for historians of science trying to correctly portray Ptolemy's importance. In the Almagest, Ptolemy borrowed heavily from Hippocrates by his own admission. In some places where Ptolemy tries to improve on Hipparchus, he clearly succeeds. However, in other places, his results have been found to contain significant errors. Later scientists even suspected that he invented much of his data to fit his theories. <laughs> Isaac Newton, in fact, called him the most successful fraud in the history of science. <laughs> So Ptolemy, yeah. <laughs> well, again, we go back to uh, Richard Feynman, who said, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. If it disagrees with experiment, it is wrong. So Ptolemy might have fudged his data a little bit because he loved his theory so much. <laughs> and that's not, that's, that's, it's not that that problem has gone away. We still have scientists who fall in love with their theory and they're reluctant to give it up. And so Feynman's, you know, Feynman's not just blowing smoke here. He's pointing out a problem that comes up. Yes. So uh, this is another physicist. His name is Freeman Dyson. He worked, he worked with a lot of these people. Uh, his peers uh, often referred to him as the most brilliant physicist to never win a Nobel Prize mm -hmm. for, for Freeman. But he had... Uh, he had some good things to say. He said, all of science is uncertain and subject to revision. The glory of science is to imagine more than we can prove. Interesting. So imagination is important, but it's not necessarily gonna give you the right answer, uh, but it gives you an idea of a direction to go and then you prove it right or wrong. So Ptolemy had good imagination. Uh, and his model was accepted as the gold standard until the scientific revolution. It did work for practical purposes, at least. It was only if you were a really a true astronomer that you could nitpick and find errors or mistakes or, or things that were wrong. It worked pretty well. So let's just take a step back, uh, look at the big picture here. We have uh, the heliocentric model and the geocentric model. Aristarchus, all by himself, he didn't have apparently any followers. All the other Greeks uh, favored the geocentric model. I put uh, Aristotle here, uh, if you remember the tutor of Alexander, among other things. Aristotle was not really an astronomer, but he liked to weigh in on everything. He had an opinion on everything. So he, he fell in love with the geocentric model. Anyway, Ptolemy, again, kind of the uh, epitome of, of, of this uh, uh, school of thought, and then it's not until scientific revolution many hundred years later uh, that we get somebody else talking about a heliocentric model. Um, okay, here's a little audio clip. In the standard geocentric model, the Earth is at the center and it does not move and it does not rotate. There are separate spheres for the moon, the sun, all five known planets, and the fixed stars. They are called the fixed stars because they don't appear to move relative to each other, although we now know that such is actually not the case. There are also spheres for air, fire, and the heavens beyond the stars, but we can safely ignore those. Now, Ptolemy realized from observation that the planets did not travel in simple perfect circles around the Earth, as earlier Greek philosophers would have. And so he had to fine-tune the model. These deviations from simple perfect circular motion around the Earth stem primarily from the simple fact that, as we know, but Ptolemy did not, 
the planets and the Earth actually orbit the sun. His fine-tuning involved the introduction of epicycles, deferents, and equants in order to account for these deviations. Of these, we will only consider epicycles in our discussions. But before we get to epicycles, we have to introduce some other concepts first. So what I'd like to do now with, with, with your indulgence is to explore a simplified version of the Ptolemaic model. So raise your hands. How many of you have been yearning for a long time to try to understand the Ptolemaic model? <laughs> <laughs> so again, I, I ask your indulgence. Maybe this will be interesting. Maybe it's too esoteric, but uh, I, had to, I had to do this. I had to do this to give this talk in order to give Ptolemy his due. So here we go. Again, I'm, I'm trying to sell you on this. It's fun. <laughs> you could go out uh, and watch the night sky over the next several months, and if you can find some planets, and by the way, if, uh, it, it, you might try this uh, if you don't already do this. If you can find a, a, a place where this, you know, there's not too much light pollution, there's so many sites nowadays where you can go on and see what's going on in the night sky, where the planets are, and so on and so forth. Um, it's kind of fun. But now you can do it with some knowledge of Ptolemy's model, and you will see uh, that it makes sense. It fits together. It makes sense in terms of it explains the observations. Uh, and you could probably understand why it took so long for people to finally break with Ptolemy and decide it wasn't, it wasn't right. All right, so... That's my sales pitch. Okay, so to do this little exercise, uh, we have to make sure we're all oriented the same way. So uh, on the one hand, I want us to think when we're looking at the diagrams, imagine that we're in outer space looking down on the diagram as though we were above the North Pole of the Earth, okay? But uh, we, need some, we need some orientation on the Earth so we've got the Washington Monument here in the Transamerica building. So the West Coast is on our right, the East Coast is on our left. And now we're gonna put a, an observer right between the two. Again, uh, West is to our right, East is to our left. And let's just for the sake of argument, forget about the tilt of the Earth's axis. And also let's assume that uh, the observer's on the equator, okay? If you don't know where I'm going with that, don't worry about it, but th that does simplify things. So this observer sees the moon rise in the east and it, and it sets in the west. And I think the observer would agree that it with that, but from our standpoint, we would actually say that the moon is doing what? It's revolving clockwise, clockwise. Again, if you're even a casual observer, you know that these heavenly bodies rise in the east. This is looking east just before dawn. And uh, the point here is that all of the heavenly bodies rise in the east and set in the west, okay? So, <clears throat> In that sense, from our vantage point, they're all moving clockwise. And this happens, when I, again, we're talking about hour to hour within the course of a whole day, they make one full clockwise rotation. So what I want you to do now is forget that <laughs> because that's what the ancients did. And if you've ever tried to look at the Ptolemy model, they don't always explain that, but you have to realize they, they, they recognize that. They call that first motion. That's the 24 hour cycle. It was so familiar to them that they ignored it, but it, it's a, just assumed. Because the real interesting part is. Indeed, from a vantage point in outer space above the North Pole, there is. we would expect to see all celestial bodies revolving clockwise from hour to hour. In the Ptolemaic system, this was known as first motion. It was assumed, but otherwise ignored. Descriptions of how the model works 
focus on motions occurring over multiple days, over weeks or months and years. As we go forward, we want to set things up so that we can ignore the 24 hour cycles for first motion. So here's a diagram and we're at outer space looking down on the earth above the North Pole, but we've got a colleague down here, an observer, a uh, stick figure, and it's midnight. It's again, you could say, well, how do you know it's midnight? Well, it's halfway between the time the sun sets and the sun rises. It's that simple. So if you've got some way of keeping time, an hourglass or whatever, uh, you can you can say free, with a high degree of certainty that it's midnight. And that means that the sun is directly below the feet of our observer. So it's midnight. And we're going to use midnight as our little snapshot in time each day. And that way we can that, that's what allows us to forget about first motion. Directly overhead, let's say, is Gemini. So this observer knows that you can't tell much by looking at the sky just one night. You got to come back night after night after night. Remember Richard Feynman, you have to be patient. You have to make a lot of careful observations over time. So the, our observer comes back the next night and this is what uh, he or she sees. That's oh, pretty much the same thing. <laughs> okay, it, it, it's gonna take a little longer, all right? So things look about the same after one night, but after 30 nights, lo and behold, Gemini has now moved towards the West. Now, these are the constellations of the zodiac, right? There's 12 of them. And uh, again, by design, perhaps, they, they, they labeled these constellations in such a way that they're evenly spaced out. There's a regular interval of 30 degrees between each constellation or zodiac sign. And with 12 of them, you get a 360 degree circle. So Gemini had and all of the constellations, in fact, everything has rotated 30 degrees in 30 days. What a coincidence. It's gonna be 360 days for them to make a full rotation. And that's what happens. As the days and months go by, Gemini at midnight descends in the West. Finally, it disappears for about six months. And then it reappears and eventually one year, uh, 360 days later, it's back right overhead. So that's that's Ptolemy's model so far. Pretty simple. Uh, things are rotating clockwise. So let's throw in a planet or two. Let's start with Mars, the red planet. And let's say at midnight on a particular night, it's, it's in line with Cancer. And now let's go forward 30 days. Aha! Mars has also moved clockwise, but not as much as Cancer has, only about halfway. So clearly it's it's in its own sphere, obviously, and that sphere is rotating clockwise, but not as fast as the sphere of the fixed stars. And let's see what happens. Uh, oh, we're going to add in that some other planets. This is a beautiful shot uh, in the evening. Usually you can't see all five planets at once, as you as you know. But in this case, they are all lined up nicely. Um, these are the five known planets. Why? Why? It's because they're the only planets you can see with the naked eye. Uh, so the five known planets, to our way of thinking, Venus and Mercury are known as the inner planets because they're closer to the sun. We're going to come back to the inner planets later when we talk about Galileo. But for right now, we're talking about Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter. So let's say, again, hypothetically, that they look like this one night at midnight. They're very close together, all of them more or less in the direction of Cancer. Now let's go forward. Let's go forward uh, half a year, 180 days. What's going to happen? Let's focus on Mars first. Well, <clears throat> let's, let's make a prediction based on Ptolemy's model. Uh, 180 days from now, Cancer it's going to be 180 degrees over here. And our question is, what's going to happen with the other planets? Well, we already know that Mars only moves about half as fast clockwise. So we're going to guess that Mars will be over here somewhere. But at that time, Libra and Scorpio are going to be over here. 
So we're, our prediction is that Mars is going to be sort of in between Scorpio and Libra over here. Let's see if we're right. Aha. So there it is. Now, uh, this is dotted line is the horizon, so we can't see it at midnight. But if we had looked a little earlier in the evening before the um, midnight, but just after the sun had set, now the sun had set, the sky glows dark, and there's Mars in between. Uh, well, I've got this labeled incorrectly, sorry. But um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's where we would expect to see it. All right, let's go back to the other two planets. Um, they're all pretty close together. They're all pretty close to Cancer. We go forward 180 days, and that's kind of interesting. They're way down here. So they've actually almost rotated 180 degrees, but not quite, because they haven't rotated quite as much as Cancer. So again, they, they each have their own sphere. And it's the only explanation. So that's Ptolemy's model. So, um, so here's the little trick we have to play in our heads. We have to sort of change our frame of reference. I've just said that everything goes clockwise, even if you ignore first motion, but they go clockwise at different speeds. But now here's another thing that can confuse you if you look at Ptolemy's model illustrated. It will often show the planets moving counterclockwise. <clears throat> well, that's relative to the fixed stars. So what's really happening is they're going clockwise, but not as fast as the fixed stars. So relative to the fixed stars, they're going counterclockwise. But here's the interesting part. However, the earliest astronomers, to their surprise and consternation, <laughs> noticed that every so often one of the planets would start moving in the exact opposite direction clockwise relative to the fixed stars. For Mars, this goes on for about 10 weeks or so. This is referred to as retrograde motion. It tends to happen on the time the planet is in opposition. That is, when it is on the opposite side of the Earth from the sun. To account for this retrograde motion, Ptolemy found it necessary to add in his epicycles to the planet's primary circular motion. Epicycles. Some of you, if you looked at Ptolemy's model, you might have heard about epicycles. What were they all about? It was all about explaining retrograde motion. And so again, this is just an illustration. Notice again, as I said, in, in books, it often shows the spheres of the planets going counterclockwise, but that's only relative to fixed stars. But then they, they execute these little pirouettes. These are the epicycles. Uh, a little loop-to-loop. -loop. And for half of that epicycle, you can see where it's going to be going more that direction instead of that direction. So that's the retrograde motion. So Ptolemy figured it out. Took a little imagination, but he figured it out. So to conclude, what we're going to do is look at an explanation for retrograde motion with the heliocentric model. So again, this, will, this, will, this is a little bit of a uh, foreshadowing of what comes next when we get to Copernicus and, and the scientific revolution. But it's a good time to introduce this to show how it's another way to explain the retrograde motion. So to orient you, uh, here's the sun and the earth and Mars. Wrote, again, we're looking down from the North Pole. They both uh, orbit the sun in a counterclockwise motion. And this pink cone represents uh, the, the path of Mars as viewed from the Earth. So this is somebody on Earth looking at Mars. And that pink cone is a record of uh, the position of Mars relative to the fixed star. So it's tracing the path of Mars against the roadmap of the fixed stars, just as the ancients were done. <clears throat> oh, and again, this is from night to night to night to night at the same time each night. It's just one snapshot in time every night. Very important always to mention that. This rectangle here is kind of where the action is going to happen. 
<clears throat> when this pink cone gets into this rectangle, you're going to at some point see the retrograde motion. And then this rectangle here, as it says, it's viewed from Earth, east to your left, west to your right, as, as we have uh, designated. So I'm just going to run the, the animation, and I, I'll try not to say anything, at least the first time through, and then see if it all makes sense. Is everybody satisfied with that explanation? I, I, when I found that online, I thought this is it. <laughs> it, it you know, it's depends on your reference. <laughs> it depends on your reference frame. Uh, let's. Whoops. I just want to uh, run it one more time just for fun. But there's another little lesson here. If you if you know something about astronomy. Again, remember I said that this retrograde motion occurs when Mars is in opposition? And you'll see that if you look. It's going to occur when the Earth is around here and Mars is around here. So Mars is going to be in opposition to Earth, and that's going to be sort of the, the heart of the retrograde motion. And what's happening, of course, is that the Earth, because it's closer to the Sun, rotates or revolves around the Sun a little faster than Mars does. And so it's going to catch up to Mars and then pass it. So it changes an Earth person's perspective of Mars. That's called parallax. It's the parallax effect. Uh, and um, we can talk more about parallax later, but we would talk about parallax in general in terms of measuring the distance to celestial objects. But this is a, a good example of the parallax effect. Let me just run it one more time for our amusement. <laughs> Earth is a, it's all approaching opposition. There it goes. A good animation is worth a thousand words. <laughs> so we've got two competing models. We haven't decided yet which one we, we like better. We've got Ptolemy's model and we've got the heliocentric model. And I think let me just, uh, one last comment, and then we'll pick this. This is kind of a good transition to Copernicus, but you might ask, well, you know, Ptolemy had this model. Is there a mathematical basis for it? Well, it turns out that these are the loop-de-loops, -loop right? So in general, the planets are making these circles, but they execute these uh, beautiful little loop-de-loops. Uh, -loop There's a geometric figure called an epitrochoid. <laughs> <laughs> There's an epitrochoid. And I think you can get the idea. This would be the circular path of the orbit as a whole. And this little circle would generate the epicycle. But you have to set these parameters, A, B, and H. But you can create uh, equations. And I don't think Ptolemy had this much algebra in his background. But if you wanted to sort of build a case for uh, Ptolemy, you could say, well, there is a mathematical basis to it. Kind of fun to look at, but it's complicated. And we're going to compare this these equations with some other equations later in the course. And I will leave you with that. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.